I'll be reading from Genesis chapter 2, uh, verse 1 and 2. Genesis chapter 2, verse 1 and 2. I'm reading from the New International Version, the NIV. <clears throat> and this is what the Bible says. Thus, the heavens and the vast, the heavens and the earth were completed in all their vast array. By the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing. So on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. Then God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. I'll repeat. Thus the heavens and the earth were completed in all their vast array. By the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing, so on the seventh day he rested from all his work. Then God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. That is the word of the Lord. You may have your seats. <clears throat> Welcome to church. Uh, for those who are here for the first time, Karibuni Sana. We are pleased to have you around. And um, let me just make this notice. Um, kindly note that all our services are streamed live. And so um, the media team behind there is helping us get this feed uh, live on the various platforms. And so um, kindly take note of that in case you have any challenges of uh, having your face, should it appear online, kindly just let us know so that uh, we take the necessary precaution. <clears throat> Our series, uh, which we began yesterday, is on the theme of stillness, silence, and solitude. We are exploring stillness, silence, and solitude. And uh, we began yesterday by just looking at the call to stillness, the call to silence, the call to solitude, particularly for the believers. And we said, this is especially important because it is so hard to do in our day to day. We explored the turbulence of the times, the many crises that we are experiencing that cause us to be anxious, cause us to struggle to just keep still. So we looked at crises like the economic, of the economic kind, the ecologic kind, ecological kind, uh, etc. It feels as though everywhere we turn, there are all these crises that cause many of us to, to be anxious. And this anxiety cannot just rest us, uh, allow us to be still and at rest. <coughs> and then we also explore the fact that the centers are not holding. Initial, uh, in the past, we had this society had these structures, this scaffolding that allowed us to have some semblance of stability. There were parents, you know, kids would grow up in, in homes that had both parents. Uh, we are increasingly seeing that is not uh, the case. Um, we had extended relatives who were present to intervene when things would go south. And um, much of that, especially with modernity and urbanization, unfortunately, has been lost. And so there are no recourses, unfortunately, when things happen. And this, again, has uh, disorganized uh, many of us. We, 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 we cannot just um, find systems that help us be still and uh, have issues resolved as and when they uh, appear. And then we looked at the reality of just the noisiness of the world and we said the world is really, really noisy. Um, from the gadgets that we have around us and literally at any one point you're surrounded by them feels like you cannot run away from them, from our pockets to now even our hands. You know, back in the day, computers used to be in a room, and only the really, you know, the tech guys would be the ones who had access and knew how to manage those things. But we have moved from going to the computer to having computers with us, like the laptops and the desktops, to having computers on us, the least watches and all those vast array of gadgetry that we all possess now, to actually having computers in us. Because the latest technologies 
are actually the ones that the technology is embedded with us. You've heard of Elon Musk's Neuralink project. They've done successful trials, and we actually have people right now who have the Neuralink uh, embedded to their brain, and they don't have to click or do anything. Like, they can just think something, and whatever they think will be displayed on the screen. Crazy stuff. We are getting increasingly to a time where even the idea of what it means to be human is now being questioned. Would you still say that embedding of technology, the, the, it's called the singularity, where the humans and the technologies are merging, would you still call that person uh, <coughs> as one reflecting the image of God? Like, really, even what it means to be human are now questions that we are grappling with. So, it's a noisy world, and the noise is everywhere. But beyond the noise, it's busy. All of us are held up with a million things. There's, at any one point, multiple things that are calling, <coughs> to, uh, calling demanding our attention. Carl Hondore <coughs> wrote a piece uh, titled, In Praise of Slowness. In Praise of Slowness. And he was just arguing the place for, just, just slow down and allow yourself to live. Because right now, it feels like for many of us, we are just existing. We are not quite living on account of all the noise and the turbulence and the um, instability that we have. But for today, I wanted us to get into scripture and just explore. So what does the Bible say about this whole subject of being still, being silent, the place of solitude? What do the scriptures actually say? And uh, I want us to explore the Old Testament, then we we'll look a bit at the New Testament. Uh, and if we have time, we have less than 10 minutes, we'll look at um, some lessons from the church history. For the Old Testament, I just want to introduce one idea that I think kind of sums up God's vision for this. And it's the whole idea of the Sabbath. And that is what we, the text we have just read. Unfortunately, our perception of Sabbath is almost entirely negative. If I asked you to tell me the first thing that comes to your mind when I mention Sabbath, for many of us, it will be restriction, right? It will be what we should not do. Do not work. Do not do X, Y, Z. So unfortunately, our perception of Sabbath, subconsciously, is predominantly negative. It's associated with death rather than life. It's associated with things we should not do rather than things we should do. Sabbath is not a delight for many of us, yeah? It is um, this list of things we should not do, and we associate it uh, with that. And yet, when Jesus talks about the Sabbath in Mark chapter 2, verse 27, he speaks of it very differently. Sabbath is a delight. In fact, he says, Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Sabbath was made for you. It was made for your delight. It was meant for your enjoyment. It's meant to be about giving life rather than taking away life. And this is why, for us, Sabbath is associated with all this drudgery and, 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 and death. We view Sabbath, if at all we keep it, because for us, Sabbath, that one day in the week, is usually spent on uh, recharging so that you'll continue with the work. And so it really is still part of the treadmill. You are on Sabbath so that you can work more effectively. And so the end goal of Sabbath is really work. It's like the way after running for a bit, the runners would go outside and take an energy boost so that they can go back. And so the end game and the thinking, our philosophizing about Sabbath and our understanding of it is recharging for more work. And that fits very well within our utilitarian and consumerist cultures and minds. It's a capitalist world, right? We are working so hard to make ends meet and all. And so Sabbath, ni kutegea tu kidogo so that we can continue with the work. And that is what Jesus meant when he says, Sabbath was meant for man, not man for the Sabbath. We view Man is made for the Sabbath, okay? So Sabbath is just a slow, slowing down so that we can continue uh, with the work. But to enter into Sabbath as God envisages it is to enter into rest. It is Sabbath is created for man. So in other words, the weekdays were created for Sabbath, not Sabbath for the weekdays. And there's a big difference. There's a big difference. 
Brothers and sisters, we are called to enter into rest. And this rest is premised on the fact that God is telling you, <coughs> if you stopped working today, the world will still run. I am the Lord of the Sabbath. I am the Lord of all. And so I may allow you to help with one bit of the work that I'm doing, and praise the Lord, he gave Adam the work of naming animals and all. But truth is, if you chose not to do what God has called you to do, the world will still run. And that is the thing we need to understand. If you died in office because of our, of our working today, imagine by tomorrow you will probably be replaced. They'll get someone else. And the person will probably even do a better job than you. So stop imagining that the world runs around you. It's a big problem today because our view of work is entirely negative. Because we view work in either one of two ways. Work is either a god, and so for some of us, we are workaholics. Work is our god. Work defines us. God is the one who defines us. We are made in God's image and likeness, right? We are the imago dei, made in his image and likeness. But for some of us, work is what defines us. And that is why some people will be very offended if you do not prefix their name with their appropriate title, if they are doctor so-and-so, and, -so, and you fail to mention doctor, they'll take serious offense because that defines them. It's almost like the sum total of who they are is domiciled on the whole idea of what they've accomplished with either their hands or their brains and all. And so that is it. Work defines us. And so if you take away that work from this person, Unfortunately for some, you've seen retirees, uh, they leave the work and die shortly afterwards because the essence of their existence, everything around them is uh, connected to the work. So work has unfortunately become a god for many of us. And that is one extreme. The other extreme is where work becomes the devil. So work can either be god or the devil. If work is the devil, then you hate it. You wake up every morning with tears running down your cheeks, you wish you could do anything but go to that work. Right? Am I speaking to someone? Can anyone relate? So, yes, it's either one of those two extremes. And either extreme is not God's design for work. Now, work as the devil is the product of this Greek thinking. Because the Greeks used to believe that work, the concept of work as labor originated from the Greeks. Because they used to believe that the gods needed to get things done at the beginning of time, and because they did not want to do those things, they created humans as slaves to do what they should have been doing. Okay? And so work is labor. So we are here on earth as slaves to do work that was meant for the gods. And when we celebrate Labor Day, that's essentially it. It's that whole idea of work as labor, work as we are slaves, we are toiling away. We live to work, Work to live and ultimately die doing it. No hope at all. But there's another perspective to work. And this is seeing work as a vocation. Because vocation means calling. And this is the, uh, the Hebrew concept of work. It sees work as a, as, a, as a calling. And a calling presupposes a caller. That means if you're called to do something, then there's someone who has called you into that thing. And work, therefore, becomes a beautiful thing. It becomes something that helps to build and grow and nurture what God has begun. And it's a beautiful thing to be part of that ecosystem and that way of thinking regarding work. And so if you see work that way, then you know that this ultimately belongs to God. The earth and the fullness thereof is the Lord's. And so if you die tomorrow, the world will still run. God has enough people to do what he has called you to do. And that makes you humble. Because you realize it makes you humble and it does not make you obsessed with work. But you do it excellently as unto God because you ultimately will give an account to the caller who is the Lord our God. Ladies and gentlemen, that's how the Old Testament, the Old Testament uh, perception of this whole place of work. And therefore when you rest, when you take that Sabbath, there's a sense of solitude and, 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 and resting in the finished work of he who began that work. And that is what we see with the likes of Jacob. God calling Jacob away from uh, his everyday 
and sends everyone away before meeting with Jacob at the ravine Jebok. You see Moses and God at the burning bush, away from everything else and everything else that would be noisy and the things that he typically do. And he settles down and engages with Moses. And with Elijah as well, when he speaks to him in a still small voice, he was away, pulled away from the crowd, pulled away from the noise to have that time of solitude and that time of stillness and silence with the Lord. And that is what he expects of us. And we see Jesus doing it as well. Jesus practiced it. He often withdrew, the Bible says, to the hills or to lonely places. Like in Luke chapter 4, verse 42, the Bible tells us, uh, he withdrew to lonely places or the wilderness, Matthew chapter 4, verse 1, or to high mountains, Matthew chapter 14, verse 23, or to the garden, uh, Matthew 26, uh, 36 to 46. And you notice with all these places, there are places where clouds are not there. It is quiet places withdrawn from the masses, from the noise. He practiced it. He prioritized it. Before he began his ministry, he spent the 40 days. And at the end of his life at the garden, he concludes with the same. And he not only practiced it and prioritized it, he preached and promoted it. Ladies and gentlemen, my prayer for us is that we will learn to be still. We will learn to break away from the rat race and the busyness of our everyday to spend time with the Lord, and to connect with ourselves. Because that ultimately helps us to get the proper view of work as God intended. Amen. Amen.